Welcome to the Uncommon Man Project, podcast number one. Today we're going to chat about the things about life when life just feels like it's in Groundhog Day mode. When you feel like you don't have that passion, you lack that drive, you're not quite sure where that next step is. Maybe you feel like you're in that midlife crisis point, which we're going to really dig deep into today about what things you can do to make it feel like more of a midlife opportunity. Two guys with us today, we have Nick and Harriet, and it's going to be an absolute pleasure to dive deep into some of these topics today welcome boys welcome how's it how's it harry i'm going to crack off with you mate because you've had a pretty interesting life especially in the last few years things have ramped up for you at a tremendous speed you actually have been a client in the past of what was formerly known as JCF, which is now the Uncommon Man Project. And can you just give us a little insight into what was going on in your life? Because if anybody's ever stalked Harry, one, he's basically an Adonis, handsome looking dude with an amazing rig, but he had a pretty interesting life. He looked like a bit of a festy rave guy with a couple of piercings here and there. And he had a little bit more hair back in the day as well. So just give us some insight of what was going on in your life then. So back before I started with JCF as a client, I was still working as a chef, still doing face-to-face PT as well. So I would do PT clients first thing in the morning from five till maybe eight-ish, then run off, do some cafe work, come back to PT in the afternoons, and as, as well as doing meal prep for a lot of the gym clients as well. So two, three nights a week after my then uh, nights doing the the classes, would go off to the cafe again, prep the meals, would often finish at, you know, like midnight, 1 a.m. a couple of times because it was just me most of the time and then be back at the gym for a 5 a.m. class. So I was running off a hell of a lot of caffeine, not a lot of sleep, which is not great for anybody. Uh, let alone someone that also has epilepsy. So for me, high stress, uh, lack of sleep or sleep deprivation, and then also alcohol, like my three big triggers. So that was a recipe for disaster. Luckily, I had the alcohol under control. That wasn't really a factor for me, but playing with fire in terms of the amount of stress, caffeine, and lack of sleep that I was kind of playing with at that point. And I remember following James for for a while and talking about the nervous system, talking about the sleep, it really intrigued me because I hadn't seen anybody else talk about this. You know, when it came to being being shredded and just being healthy in general, it was all diet and training. That was pretty much it. And I like to think I was pretty freaking lean, so I had that one down pat between the chefing and everything else I'd kind of researched about nutrition, thought I was pretty on point with that side of things as well. But looking at the other markers of health, like my, my sleep, my guts, my ability to handle stress and like even my mental health, probably not the best. And I know my now wife can attest to that, how agitated and irritable and anxious and self-conscious I was because of, all of those other factors was live around then in your life then your now wife yeah yeah so she was dealing with all that stuff as well so funny funny story she organized before i was a client she organized for my birthday for james to come down and train with me face to face one-on-one so for my birthday he came down to sydney we trained together and then i think it was about three or four months later is when i signed up as a client and then that's when we started working on the sleep and all that other good stuff and got exposed to our our approach to health. You competed in bodybuilding as well or body sculpting at some stage oh, like, as well. There's some pictures of you on some stages somewhere with some really small underwear and some pretty big rig. Yeah, not a whole lot going on. Yeah. Um, it was a fit, fitness model, I think it was, was the category. So like not big enough to be a bodybuilder, but like lean enough to do something. So that was just something to work towards because at that point I wasn't able to play sports and have that competitiveness and I was getting bored of just training for the sake of training. So I was like, oh, let's do something with it at right. least. And that was a cool discipline. All right. So since then, like some pretty massive things have happened in your life. One, you started the business Primal Energies, which is 
the coolest thing ever. Like in terms of the number one product that we love probably the most is your coffee replacement, which is the brain juice, which is off the chain. The boys just can't shut up about it. How good. You've got that going. You're a business partner in the Uncommon Man Project and you had a kid. Now, for those of the guys who don't know Harry, like I know Harry, Harry is one of the most structured and succinct dudes I know. Like he runs a calendar so tight that, well, yeah, you wouldn't get anything else in there. How do you, what changed when you had Jax, your now son? <laughs> oh, man. Like, at first, it wasn't much. Not, not I wasn't willing to change much. And, and that was real freaking hard. For someone that is so structured, that likes to know what I'm doing, when I'm doing it, and lives by that level of organization, then having this, this thing that tries and sleeps and disrupts everything else and tells you when you get to go to the gym and when he's going to eat and when he's going to sleep and all that kind of stuff, it made it extremely difficult. And that was probably for the first few, probably at least the first two months, was the hardest adjustment for me was restructuring the way that I did things and at certain points being able to actually let go and know that well today I'm not going to get anything done he's not happy he needs my more of my attention and like there's other it was a reordering of priorities I guess and I it actually made me realize how fucking selfish I am like how much I like to do things on my time on my terms and fuck everybody else and babies don't really like that they don't like telling being told hey go find your own bottle man go figure it out like <laughs> there's kind of things you need to do there would you say you have like issues around control yeah for sure yeah like uh, i don't i don't like not having control over things and so for me especially like this is something I've voiced, voiced to you recently in the transition from JCF to the Uncommon Man Project for the first time in my life, not being on a salary, that level of, of control was also, or in that space, like the safety and security was not there. And so that was a huge source of stress for me. Not only is that foreign to me in general, but it's now not just my own mouth that I've got to feed my own stuff I got to look after, but I've now also got to provide for my wife who's unable to work full time because we have a kid, we've got to share that load. And now him as well, who's onto solids and got his own expenses and all that kind of stuff. So trying to find my own, or draw the line of things that I can control and things that are beyond that level of control has been where I've been tinkering and trying to find recently which has been a big source of stress. Cool. So what have you done to help with the uncertainty that is your life right now and most of life in general? Mm. What I found extremely helpful for me is bringing it back a lot. Like, so we we always, not always, but we like to say to everyone, you're like, what can and can't you control? And, you know, logically that's real easy. Like, oh, well, I can't control, you know, the government, I can't control other people, I can't control the weather and stuff. Like, yeah, 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 that cool makes logical sense. But then being also able to say, well, okay, I'm still pretty stressed about this stuff. Like, what can I do about this stuff? And something that really helped me was watching some of Alex Hormozzi's content. You know, if anyone's that, that's seen him in and knows his journey, he's lost all his stuff, all his money, all his businesses like twice before. And the thing that he talks about in finding that security and being in rebuilding is having the skills and the knowledge to be able to do that. So when you have the, those skills and that knowledge, then it doesn't really matter what they take away from you. Cause realistically you can lose everything. Like you can have a storm that knocks down the house, you know, you, your wife or your family can die or they leave you or you can have all your money stolen like you can have everything taken away from you but if you have the skills or the knowledge or whatever it takes to to build those things up then until they come and slit your throat 
you'll always be able to make money. You'll always be able to find or regain those assets. And so for me, building up those skills has been my form of finding that safety and that security. Uh, you're talking, you're teetering on a couple of massive things here. One, like confidence, two, confidence, and three, like where you're actually, use, I use that word providing. Like people always, especially in the men's space, especially us men in general, like how are we providing? We think that's financial. And don't get me wrong, like I'm a big believer that money's a big help in buying happiness because it is. But yeah. where, how are you navigating confidence, competence, and that value piece of like actually adding value to your family because you're not just doing it financially obviously so st start with confidence like how is that showing up for you like how am i expressing that or finding that how are you finding it yeah like you, you go into a place you don't have a salary anymore you can't rely on that but you what skill set are you confident that you can just bring to the world and go you know what if i lose everything i'm going to go with this mm. well I'm confident that I can I can help people that I can solve problems that like I'm definitely not perfect but as you've helped me to see a lot of the time that I have been able to juggle a lot of things that other people have kind of let go of in the pursuit of that prov providing or in the pursuit of that money of that family or whatever it might be and so for me the more action that I can take is the more feedback that I can get if I sit here and then think about all the things that I can't control or go get caught in, in that space, then I'm I'm no better off. I'm just sitting here hoping something gets, you know, delivered to me in this shiny little parcel. But for me, if I can tune my communication in the form of words, either providing in content providing value, writing ad copy, you know, putting myself out there in that space, then naturally as you become a better communicator, as you, you know, meet more people, then these opportunities present themselves to you, right? Because you put yourself out there, like you enable these opportunities to come to you because you express yourself that way instead of just taking a back seat and, oh, I just hope this works out. Like worst case scenario, okay, cool. I go back to Sheffering, I go and get a face to face job. Like it's not that bad. Like that's the backup plan, really. But I don't think I'm gonna to get to that point because I've I feel like I'm creating enough opportunities in this push. And just just for those guys listening and like, well, why the fuck should I listen to Harry? Like it's a it's a very valid point to understand that Harry balances life extremely well even though he yeah has this control factor harry has exceptional fitness he'd be in the top five percent of the world with where he's at in terms of his how how he looks how he presents himself what he can perform he has an amazing relationship he's a father yeah it's not like he has 12 kids but he's he's a father and he runs two businesses yeah we're not talking multi multi-million dollar businesses here we're talking still great businesses that have been built from zero literally in the garage of his apartment to the point where now he's, you know, selling thousands and thousands of dollars worth of great stuff. That's why listening to this guy and understanding where he's gone and how he's balanced it is so important. And it's something, like he said, that we've talked about. I'm like, you need to get that across to guys because one of the hardest things, especially as men, when we get caught in this world of this providing, we struggle with that balance. And so many guys are overwhelmed. They're anxious. They've got that belly fat going on. They don't know what their purpose is. They lack that drive, that confidence, and that confidence. And it scares the shit out of them every day that, well, what happens if I lose my business? The funny thing is, and I find this really interesting, I love your guys' input here, is like you could lose your job tomorrow. Anybody who's got a salary job, you could be walked out tomorrow. There is no safety yeah. and security. Oh, anything in life, like how much, even if you think you own your house, you don't pay a couple of bills and then they can come and collect it. You don't, like, you don't really own anything. There's not much security there. I think it's like false security in all that space, right? But it's, and this was a huge shift in my relationship when I was in that space where I was 
really insecure. I had very low confidence. I was highly overwhelmed and anxious. And whenever Liv would, would go out with the friends, I was that, you know, that nice guy, that toxic fucking boyfriend that's always fucking texting. What time are you going to be home? Where are you now? Where are you doing? Like all these kind of stuff, stressing the fuck out, you know, staring at my phone, waiting for the three dots to appear, like to see when she's going to text me back, stressing the fuck out. And like so worried that she was going to leave me, that she was going to cheat on me, that the world was going to end and like all this stuff was going was to happen. And then it eventually dawned on me that I'm creating my own reality by doing that. Like who is going to want to be with someone that is showing up like that? Like, I don't know about you guys, but how often have you ever been like socializing out with your mates and you're getting paragraphs and paragraphs and you haven't even responded? How, how excited are you to go? Are you going to be to go home? Probably not very. Like you want to stay out and you want to like do all these other things and that makes them feel, feel worse. And so you've got one of two choices then. You either keep going down that road and manifest them cheating or leaving you. And then you're like, oh, I was right. I knew this would happen. And you, know, you put it on them when you created that. Or accept that, well, whether they're going to cheat on me or going to leave me, they're going to do that anyway. Whether I'm sitting here anxious and crying at my phone or I'm just chilling back, watching a movie, ordering Uber Eats, doing whatever. Like, why not do the latter? ladder you know at least that way i'm having a good time i'm not so stressed out if it's not meant to be it's not meant to be and that level of not disconnect but like it's i guess that realization was a huge weight off my shoulders i was able to be so much more calm i had this new level of confidence that well i can't control that so I may as well have fun, not was stress this, so much. Was this the realization that what you create, what you want? Or was this the realization if you cared less, Liv would hang out with you more? <laughs> <laughs> well, it was that if I don't, like, what's the point in me stressing? If I can't, it's not going to do anything. It's not helping me. It's not helping the relationship. It's like no one is benefiting from this. It's actually making everything worse and if i truly don't want her to leave me or to cheat on me or to like to do any of those things that i've told myself are going to happen as, as to why i'm stressing out then well something kind of needs to change okay right. there's stacks of guys saying yeah yeah i feel yeah i see i'm in the exact same situation and we come from a world of questioning right we live in the world of questionings we're a big believer in that you know the quality of your life is dictated by the quality of questions if you were if you were to offer a question to the guys listening that would help them deal with that or start to rewire their brain in a way that they could start thinking about it, what would the question be? For all the thoughts that you're thinking, for every all those all those scenarios that you've painted in your head, ask yourself, what else could it be? The reason she hasn't responded in two seconds flat. Could it be she's having a good time? Doesn't mean she's on her knees with another guy. Could it be that she's, you know, left her phone at the table where she's gone to the toilet or she's ordering food or she's doing, you know, this myriad of other things, not these things that you just catastrophized that make you feel like the worst thing on earth. Okay. So just what else could it be? And I guarantee you'll be able to find something that's closer to reality than the things that you've spun out and gone down that rabbit hole with. That's good. I like that. All right. Thanks, Harry, mate. I appreciate that. Thanks for sharing with you. Pleasure. I, will, I hope that's helpful for some guys. Yeah. I bet it will be, bro. I bet it will be. Now, look, I want, you, I want to introduce you guys to a man, Nick. I've known Nick for quite a few years now. In fact, it's very odd that I've known him for so long and we've never actually met in person. And one of the beautiful things, actually, this April, we're running one of our events in Bali, which is going to be incredible. And he's flying in from South Africa to meet all of us, which is going to be fantastic. Nick comes from... It's such a hard background to describe because the area that this guy has worked in is so vast and it's so deep from a 
from a spiritual perspective. I remember getting on the phone with this guy and I was, I was dealing with a lot of shit in my life, mostly actually some massive financial issues and they were giving me problems with my back. I remember he's on the call. He has no idea about any of this stuff, by the way. And he talks to me and he's like, that pain by your scapula in your right-hand side, I want you to just breathe into that now and just let that go. And I was like, how does a guy on the other side of the world on a Zoom know where pain is in my body? And that was an opening to what has become a really phenomenal relationship and, and now a business partner, which is absolutely awesome. But I, I really want to dive into Nick's story because he has a wealth of knowledge, no hair, and um, a pretty amazing relationship and family as well. So, Nick, mate, awesome to have you on here, as always. Thanks for having yeah. me, mate. Yeah. <laughs> I, feel does... like, I feel like I've been very quiet, very yeah. quiet. Yeah, take it I'm going to ask, where did your life uh, as a as a monk looking man uh, begin? Like, how did you how did you enter this world of helping yourself and helping others? Fuck. Um, I suppose just to just to give like a a, a tidbit of the story, um, it it started off with, you know, I think with many people. Um, maybe early 2000s, in the 90s, it, it was very difficult to diagnose one as someone that, who was experiencing mental health issues. Um, and I was chronically depressed. So it, it wasn't just necessarily a how I was brought up, but it was also just the way I was. But and When you um, say like chronically depressed, like how how is that showing up? Like what did that look like? You know, it... it I didn't really realize it until I was in my teens and I, yeah. I had a conversation with a couple of psychologists, psychiatrists, and I got into some SSRIs, went down that whole path. But it was just, you know, growing up through whatever, let's say, you know, traumatic experiences or, you know, exposure to narcissism, to diet, to just whatever my physical predisposition was it literally felt like the world had no texture, no color, no light, and no point. And everything that I did just felt that, like that hollow, that hollow sense of like, oh, I'm doing this to appease someone else. I'm doing this because this is just what you do when you're going through the process of growing up. You know, you play your sport, you go out and socialize, you, um, as you grow older, you obviously start taking stock of your body and maybe you want to build that. Um, you've got to study. And it was just going through the motions of life, but nothing really excited me. Even girlfriends and people that were in my close circle, um, it, it just never felt like life. And I mean, I tried a lot of different things as I was growing up and nothing brought that life to me. Um, <clears throat> and when I had that first conversation with someone where I was diagnosed um, by, by a, a professional, they, they said, like, you, you present all the symptoms of, like, chronic depression, and I think you should see a psychiatrist. And that's when I was like, holy shit. Like, this is the first time I've heard of this. And then I was like, well, okay, well, let me start taking these pills because evidently they fix everything. And then I started taking these pills and I felt worse. I didn't even feel like a human being. It was just like this husk going around. And look, I thought I was a husk, but after that, I just felt no connection to anything. And I did that for a while. And um, that's when I, there was a lot of questions that started to arise and say, well, is this the only way forward? And I started scratching at these four walls that I built my life around and eventually found a door. And I, I think through religious questioning, a lot of spiritual um, insight, and just, I, I think just a lot of tenacity, I, I found that door and I could open it. Um, what, what happened? Like when you opened that, what do you, what do you mean by like open it? Did you see things? Did you feel things? Like what, what changed? Did you get off the drugs? That was the first step. So I, I was a high, high performer in sport, um, would 
really like push my body beyond where it should be going. And um, I, I got off the SSRIs. I started listening to Tony Robbins. Uh, you'd listen to his audio books. The, what is it? The Giant Within. I think that yeah. was one of his ones. Started there. Um, and I just said, there's no fucking way that I'm going to sit with this stuff in my system. And I did more research on it. And I said, well, this doesn't make sense. Like if I were diagnosing someone just as a professional, I would be looking for the root cause and not be trying to mask anything and throw a bandaid on it. And that's what was happening. And I just said that there must be another way to live. And it got me to really look at the foundations that I built myself on. Um, some of the, the experiences that I had as a kid that shaped me and I was able to get off it and really just like build a mindset where depression was just this idea. And I no longer identified with this word that means so much in society. And I think is interpreted differently by everyone. Um, that was the big one uh, alongside a, a couple of interesting, like spiritual ahas, um, within myself. And I think the big takeaway from that was just seeing the power that I had given away to everyone else from, you know, parents to maybe religion to, you know, the, the medical system. And I was like, how the hell am I giving this back to myself? Well, it was by making a choice and finding a way that made sense to me, that felt right to me. How, so how old were you when that happened? Like when you sort of came out, as we say, into that spiritual realm and that finding your own power. That that started happening at about 17, like with, with this transition. Um, I had a, a couple of big like spiritual experiences uh, in, in well, before 10. Um, but from about 17, that's where it's like you actually like need to put like action behind insight. And it's not just an idea. And you've got to say, well, no one else is seeing what I'm seeing and experiencing what I'm experiencing. This is fundamentally my experience. And I've got to take some form of accountability instead of diving in with this whole victim mindset, like, holy shit, like I'm going to be on pills for the rest of my life or whatever the case may be. Um, and then, yeah, the, then the next, I suppose the next part of the journey came in, which I was on my way to um, having celiacs and Crohn's disease. So I found that out. At and, 17, uh, around there. 17, 18, I was like, oh my goodness, this this, this is an ideal. And obviously the world doesn't know a lot because that's like, what is like 14, 15 years ago. And people are like, holy shit, like no one really understands this. They just call it IBS. They still just call it yeah. IBS. We weren't woke enough back then, bro. You know, just no, you weren't, we, we weren't woke. No, really. <laughs> and, and in my country, like this whole idea of gluten and gluten intolerance, this whole thing didn't really exist. Like, yes, there were places, but you would look at those people and be like, bro, like it's just bread. It's, it's, there's nothing wrong with it. And then you start doing the research. It's like, no, it's not. It's, it's really not just that. It's, your body doesn't want to process that shit. So I, I went through a bout of um, like extensive dietary changes alongside studying in university and studying a course that I didn't want to study. Um, so I had no boundaries with that. I clearly didn't have the vision and the, the, the direction that I wanted in life. So I went to the construction industry, did project management, cost engineering. Um, and then in between that, somehow found a... A child in the mix of that that journey so I decided to have a baby um, so hang on rewind a, a moment there so how did karis your now wife enter your life then do you want the pg-13 or do you want like the r18 <laughs> you married an orgy yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no we, we 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 actually we actually like met each other a few times over the years like i, I used to like go out a lot and party a lot and drink a lot and do all those things, um, live and uh, find myself and other people. And uh, like we, we'd always like bump into each other and just have like really good conversations. And I think it was just one night where I don't know. Conversations, just... I see. Well, it was conversations. <laughs> horizontal <laughs> conversations. <laughs> horizontal conversations. And then led, led to led to a, I don't know, it was, a, it was a very early morning, like probably 2, 3 a.m. And I said, let's go on a date tomorrow. Let, let, let's go on a date. Like I, I, I really like our conversations because everyone was like so 
so drunk and inebriated at that point in time. I just said, well, you're still standing. Not that we were sober, but we were still standing and talking and it was interesting. And we went the next day and that was it. Like we, it was the best pizza and glue vine that we've ever had. And it was just, it, everything just opened up from there. And I suppose that the rest is history, a lot of history, but the rest is history. Um, and found out I was having, having a kid um, after like, I think we were about two and a half years together. And um, yeah, that, that accelerated the whole Crohn's thing. So the amount of stress, I couldn't deal with stress, couldn't deal with anxiety. Depression came in. I lost like 15 kilograms. Can you imagine this physique with yeah, 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 yeah. kilograms? Imagine I a monk like losing I, 15 kilograms. Yeah, I can imagine. Cancer patient. Like I literally looked like I had cancer, like, and I was on chemo. That, that's what it looked like. And um, it, that, that was probably the biggest wake up call um, was just seeing like, holy shit. So this is what it looks like when you are not able to deal with your emotions and regulate your nervous system and empower yourself because I was completely disempowered within that process in hospital, got a newborn on a drip. I can just have fluids. What the fuck? Like, where do I go from here? I'm not even like 25. I'm, oh yeah, I'm man. I want to, I want to, I want to touch on that. Like, okay, cool. cool. So you're about to have a kid. You're coming in. What are your expectations as a father? Like it, it, what it means to be a father to you? You know, you've got okay. nine months. So, well, the first thing in my mind at that point in time is I'm busy with my second thesis. Yeah. I need to get okay. that shit out. I need to fucking get that. Number two is like, I need to get a job because dad must have job to provide for family. But unfortunately, we had such a great economy and job market. I was like, holy shit. I mean, I'm sending out CVs. I'm having conversations. I'm look, looking not even just in South Africa. I'm looking you know, for expat work. But you've got no experience because no one wants to have a, a yeah, in South Africa, like a, a, what do we call it, like a freshman, like coming into you know, their, their work and just doing free labor, essentially, because it's, it's a hassle. People are very closed off with that unless you've, you've got connections. But I suppose the bigger question with all of that is I didn't have any healthy role models. So my biologic, I, well, my non-biological father passed away when I was three. Um, at that moment in time in my 20s, I'd found out that I had a biological father who I'd never met. So the guy that died was not my guy that I should have worried about or been concerned about. And then the, the stand-in men over the period of years were very, very emotionally unwell and constipated. So they had anger issues. They had self-confidence issues. They had all these things. And that's what I saw. So I saw narcissism, abuse, anger, infidelity, the whole nine yards for most of my life. And that terrified the living shit out of me because in my mind, I never even thought about being a father. Like I didn't even, that wasn't even on the cause. It was become a professional, piss off overseas and just go live my life and find peace. And I might be very lonely. Maybe I'll even be asexual. It was just a thing of that. That was the plan that I kind of had in my head. Cause I'm like, okay, this degree should give me the ability to do that. But uh, that, that didn't happen. So sitting there, it was like, wow. I don't know what the next step is, but I sure as hell know what not to do. So that's better than not having a, a place to start. Yeah. That's, see, do you find it interesting that we have all this knowledge? Let's be honest, you can find pretty much everything out on the internet. It may not always be the same thing. You can always also find what contradicts each other. But yep. it's actually knowing like what not to do and where you are right now, that is probably the biggest key to taking the next step because there's, there's just so much information. It's overloaded, mm. right? What do you what do you guys think? Like if you're clear on like how much of a fuck up you are right now, but you're actually clear and honest with yourself and you're like, cool, well, I know not what to do. So what's the opposite of that action? Like can you do you reckon people can just start there? That's the place? 
I think it's different trying to start. Logically, people know what they should and shouldn't do in, in life. But like when you're deep in those emotions, yeah. then that makes it really hard to act out of that logic. Right? That's true. So trying to do those things that, you know, as you said, you can look up anyone on YouTube or anything on, on Google, you know, like how to achieve this or, or what to do here. But when you're in the thick of that anxiety, that depression, that overwhelm, that anger, that like that lower vibrational emotion, then how you pull yourself out of that, how you, like, that's, this is how hard feels, man. Like you can expect like, oh, it's going to be hard. It's going to be difficult. And then you go and do it and you're like, oh, this is what hard feels like. Like this is what, people talk about and this is why it's so difficult to pull yourself out of that and to re recheck yourself it, right. it's it's the will i think it's you know you you look at that and what's what's the big differentiator it's not just necessarily not what to do it's all these people that you typically do seek advice from or have written these books they've lived it they've done it there's weight it's it's not it's not just words and yes, the actions might sound very similar or recontextualized with a slightly different strategy. But essentially what all these people have done is they've recognized that they are not their circumstances, that they are not their emotions, and that they have the freedom of choice and will to action something different, no matter what that looks like. Like your life could be collapsing. But it's that decision that they make over and over and over again. That's what differentiates them from 95% of everyone else. Okay. Because I reckon this is absolutely key. So you're basically on a drip being fed the same food at rest homes. Yeah. And we've coached a lot of men who are dads, right? Or a lot of men who are becoming dads. And what I often see is like, well, when the kid comes that will motivate me to change because I'll, I'll have a kid then. So I, it'll, it'll make me want to be better. I'm going to rely on this external thing to like, I'm, I'm, that's going to give me drive. And the kid comes and I'm like, fuck, now I've just got less time. I've got less sleep. I've got more overwhelm. I'm more stressed and I'm more unmotivated. How come you went from being on a drip, eating slug food to getting out? Was it this realization that you weren't any of these things? Did the having a kid kick you up the ass? To be honest, I don't think it was one specific thing. I think having a kid and just recognizing the responsibility of that is this is this was this was probably my hardest lesson for the first few years, and this is where I failed as a father. It's just. Um, you know, I, I, I used to, I don't, I don't want to say I blamed my son. I never blame my son, but I blame myself for the actions that put us, let's say, in the financial position that we were in or put him in circumstances which were unfavorable, even though they weren't really, he was unaffected, but the guilt and the shame. And I, I, that there, I already had in that moment. And that pain was pushing me to look outside but I didn't know where the fuck to look. So it's like, I, I want to do something. There's a lot of internalized pain. And all he has done is magnified the amount of work that I still need to do within myself. I have no idea what I'm doing exactly. The, the, the wounds that were never healed, the wounds that I didn't even know were there. And I'm now having to look at all this stuff. I'm having to look at my relationship. I'm having to look at my porn addiction. I'm having to look at my gaming addiction. I'm having to look at the parts of me, all my coping me mechanisms at that moment in time. I'm having to look at my friend group. I'm having to look at what direction I have for my life because I've never really been able to make a decision for myself. It was always what your mom thinks you should do or what, your mother's friends would advise you to do with your life because of their vast experience as an adult. So I was already living a life, another person's life. And now it's like, oh shit, their idea of me had shattered. They've got no idea what to do. This is the end of like their version of Nick. 
and you sit there in this chaos and it's just like, well, I'm either going to just sit here and lay down, play dead, or I'm going to just stand up, take a step, take another. It can't be worse than just sitting here. And even if I'm walking in circles for a bit, which happened, you'll have to find some, something's going to have to change. S something. So I, I, I think you could maybe equate it to a spiritual thing of the dark night of the soul when you're really having to meet yourself. And that's when it moved from this physical like experience or like this emotional experience more to a spiritual experience. That's when that's when that component really began to, began to shine through because the the religious side of things like I'm, I'm going to be very frank with everyone yeah I was like a, a, a Roman Catholic that's how I was brought up but from the age of like 12 I was questioning that it didn't speak to me it just it felt contained and framed and it, it just didn't make sense there were just so many like paradoxes and incongruencies and that's when I I had to let go of that you know, version of God and well-being and uh, way of existing and find that sense of self. Yeah. I got a question for you because mm. Karis was in your life at this stage and the woman in our lives are the mirrors. They are the thing that awaken the soul of the man to become its greatest version of itself. Mm. But to become a greatest version of yourself is to be challenged. That is the only way to get there. How did, how did Karis affect you in that space at that time? What happened? We hated each other. Hated each other. Hated the, the decisions that we made. We, we disliked each other like to the point where it was like, okay, Nick, you are going away to work. I'll stay with my parents. We'll figure this out. I'll probably start working or whatever the case is. Um, let's, let's figure it out. So I would only then see her like every month. I'd have to fly back because it was too long to drive. It would have been like 15, 16 hours to drive from where I was working. Um, so I'd see my kid like once a month um, as well as her. And you'd stay in contact. And I mean, that, that beats you. That's like if, like for 28 days, you're in solitary confinement. You're with yourself. You're what now were you doing for a job? I was working at a, on, a, on a, one of the biggest power stations here, or the biggest one here in South Africa. Um, and I was managing teams, and I was doing calculations and rate of progress. And so I was like physically involved, and then obviously just from the, from the, the managerial perspective as well. Um, and that, that was, that was shit. That was absolute shit. So I mean, it's like 4 a.m. mornings, 7 p.m. nights, Monday to Saturday, sometimes Sunday. And then you sit with that and you look at your life and you're like, what the fuck? So in between that, when I was feeling really sorry for myself because I've got no support network, I don't care. I'm like, what else am I going to fucking do? Well, I gamed, I gamed a lot and I had to like, I started like really looking at myself. So I started reading more books. I hated reading, fucking hated it. So Tony Robbins came back in. Tony Robbins was there. But then we threw in something called Eckhart Tolle, who was like, oh, a new earth. This is interesting. This makes something. Then throw in a couple of spiritual experiences in between and literally having to look at your demons in the eye and be like, you know, and having it reflected in everyone around you, who you, when you're going to work, you're seeing these people who have no dreams, who are stuck in the system that are sucking the life out of them. I eventually grew another testicle and went to my, well, the, one of the, one of the directors after about nearly like 11 months. And I said, dude, I need my family to move down here. I can't do this. This is not going to work. So I moved out of the shitty small town that I was in which was now a longer drive to the, the actual site, but at least Karis could move down. But we had nothing. We hardly had any money. Like it was like you're scraping through creditors, shitting the bed, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so that, then they moved down, but 
then everything was amplified because now it's like, oh, wow, now that's the system. That's the, the rinse and repeat. That's the cycle that you're living in. And we really hated each other. The only thing that got us through, to be honest with you, by some love of God was sex. We were really good at that part. But everything else like, it was fucking horrible. It was, it was, she would do yoga every day. And I, that's when I also started with like my EFT work. I found a guy called Brad Yates. And I started looking at this and I was like, holy shit. And I got a spiritual healer mentor who was like helping clear my system because I could feel these fucking parasites and things and blocks. And I was becoming aware, but I felt completely disempowered. So I was learning about these esoteric principles and things because the medical system had fucked me. And then to add to the, the joy of this experience, I got something called the, I think it's the Coxsucky virus. Um, Coxsucky virus. Sounds like a great virus to get. Oh, it, can we can we get some of that? It, like, it, can you get it, it over here? It, you don't sucky your cocky. <laughs> <laughs> don't, don't do that. But it it affected my heart muscles. So yeah, like now it's like oh my god, like you're having like tachycardia. Your heart isn't working properly. I don't have medical aid or insurance because I can't afford it, and I'm on a drip again. A fucking expensive drip. So to equate it, like once a week, I'd have to go for about a thousand dollar drip to live, to function. I don't have that. My rent is like $600. I'm making just under $2,000 a month. Jeez. I can't do anything. And I'm, I'm already in debt. So it was, it was that experience. And then I don't know what it was. Like we, we probably did that. We, we built a business in between that because she was going through a postpartum, like crazy postpartum. Um, so we called it mindful mom. So it was like really focusing on herbs and she literally studied books and books and books and like herbology and all these different things, like understanding, like, uh, you know, you know, if a person does have PTSD or chronic PTSD and we were both going through like understanding like trauma, because a lot of her childhood trauma was also coming up. So yeah, I'm trying to hold space for someone. I was holding space for myself. We tried to fix two very broken people who are trying to like unplug themselves from all these narratives and everything that's been reflected around us is poverty is infidelity is complaining of your partner is lack of power is, you know, lack of present parenting. But with all of that, that was just like shining, you know, light in the areas that we wanted. I don't want to say fix, but wanted to heal from and grow in. I want to I want to touch on that thing that you mentioned space. Uh, I'm going to actually th throw this to you, Harry, because I use the example when I talk to men. I'm like, right, imagine a yurt. A yurt has like a big fucking stick in the middle. Well, this is how I imagine it anyway, right? I'm like, as the man, you are the pillar of that yurt. You provide something to tie guide ropes to, something to provide protection to, something to provide space. Yes, there's a financial aspect to it because I imagine yurts are expensive. But what is it? Because you've had a pretty we've – we've spoken about you becoming a new dad and the things that you thought were going to happen and the things that have happened due to that. What do you feel you have provided that's not necessarily financial, that is more orientated around that space, that has allowed, one, you to be the pillar and, two, live to really lean into – Whatever it is she wants to be, whether that's a business owner, whether that's a mother, whatever it is, how do you think you've gone about that? Oh, um, that's a difficult one. Like, I think providing more than it took a while to actually get to that realization of as a dad, providing is not just financial. Like, when we say as a dad, we want to be the provider, like, we it's assumed that we're talking about money in terms of finances but also providing the example as you said providing that the space like live also runs a business like she's a very independent woman so this was a big change for her as well and even for our dynamic there was a fair bit of like, she had to rein in her own almost resentment of, of me to begin with because 
I'd still get up and go to the gym. Like I'd still kind of do my thing because, you know, they're sweet fuck all. I don't have titties to to feed him from. So she's the one that had to go through the pregnancy, the whole birth thing. She's, her, her body's all fucked up. She's feeling like a cow because of the, the soft stomach and everything like that and literally having something suck the life out of her and not having the independence to go to the gym to provide like you know because she likes to earn her own money and contribute do 50 50 all that kind of stuff so hers was kind of gone and so for us to find that balance of of that space so that we each get time with jacks we each get time with each other we each get our personal time as well has been a huge challenge and i think for for us being able to prioritize things on on a business level on a personal level family level like relationship level all those kind of things has been really helpful in with the limited time that we do have prioritizing the highest reward on like what we need f- right. as a family f- to stay connected as a couple and just function as individuals, as a couple, as a family, as a household too. I've got a question on the resentment factor. We, we all coach men a lot, mm-hmm. right? And I think, and I assume this for women because I have it in my own relationship and I like it in the other person that they are their own person. They take care of themselves. They go after the things they want. They have their own goals. They have their own vision. When we talk to men, a lot of them talk about, well, I spent all this time being a dad. I don't know what my goals are. Or they get to the point and their wife wants to leave them because they're just kind of bored or that that's not the same guy that they fell in love with because the guy feels like he lacks drive, feels like he lacks motivation, doesn't feel like his own man. And one of the things I have to repeat again and again to our guys is like, dude, what are you doing to fill up your cup? You can't pour from an empty cup. Like, what are your dreams? What are your goals? What are your aspirations? What are you going after? And they're like, I don't know. And I'm like, well, think about that from an attractive point of view. Like, does, does your woman find that attractive, a man who doesn't know what he wants anymore? And they've embedded this life and this behavior where, they are the guy who doesn't just provide the space and everybody leans on him, that he needs to do everything else as well. So he just becomes this continuous idea of provider. He has no boundaries. He And because of the lack of boundaries, he's exhausted all the time. He has no drive, therefore no confidence. Therefore, he's just a bit of a meat sack walking around. And the woman in his life is like, well, that's not that attractive. But they think to keep their family around, to keep their family well, that they just keep giving, giving, giving. Like, what have you done to maintain your goals? Because I know you've got some massive goals. And also, how have you helped live, like, have her goals and her vision still as well, you know, with all the changes going on? One of the things that really, really helped me, or, or I guess I'll start this with, like, one of the things that I struggled with initially was, as you said before, about that motivation. Like, when when you have a kid, right, you're assuming or you're feeling like, oh, I'm going to have this like this this child, I'm going to be this provider, or you're motivated to be this amazing dad and, and do all those things. And for me, that really peaked about three months before Liv gave birth. Like, it really hit like oh shit this is happening and then so that lit a fire under my ass like nothing else but then once he's born then there's that that balance that not balance there's that struggle between uh, there's i'm motivated by him to provide this life to be this man to be this father this husband this amazing role model to be all these things but then there's the other side that's almost like you have to fight against giving up on those things because of the burden or because of the stresses of raising the child, because of the sleep deprivation, because of the lack of time, because of like, you know, it's so easy to fight, to use the kid as an excuse. I don't have time. I don't have the energy. I don't have, you know, list your fucking, you know, excuse because of him. And that was something that 
even through that frustration and that res initial resentment and things like that, I never wanted to be. I never wanted to be the dad that said I couldn't because of him. Like not just for him, but also for my own pride as well. I wanted to be that guy. Or I still want to be that guy that was able to build the business, build these things, be that man, be that husband, be that dad, despite the lack of time, despite all these kind of things. And then so you find new ways to be hyper efficient because you know, dude's down for 30 minutes. You've got 30 minutes to get shit done. Like he's going to wake up crying whether you've done work or not. So move boy right so that shift was really helpful in actually being as productive as i could to get all that work done because it's not just for me at least anyway like achieving some of those things but it's also being the man that is capable of those things so having the skills, having the, the traits that you earn along the way in building the multi-million dollar business, in having that loving relationship, in creating that spark and that uh, attraction and that excitement, despite having to look after a nine-month-old, despite, you know, having date nights once a month if you're lucky, you know, and despite also having to work from home, like it's quite difficult to know that I sit here for however many hours a day, five meters away is a baby that's either crying or playing most of the time when lives at home as well, or he's sleeping there. And then, so it's not unless un, other than my gym session and a, the occasional walk, it's easy for me to go five, six days without leaving these four walls, which is easy to go mad. Right? It's not, not, diff, not hard. So Liv and I have always found that when we prioritize those those times so that she's also working towards her goals. So she has her business goals. She has her things that she's working towards together as well. And we've always said that, yes, it would be nice when I get to the point of these things are enough to provide everything that we need that she doesn't have to work, but she still will. She'll still do her thing because she wants her own independence. She wants her own life. She wants her own thing to go and enjoy life and, and I guess, find yeah. her way to contribute and be her own person. Yeah. Because for me personally, I, I'm not attracted to someone that just wants to sit at home and just do nothing all day. Like, like you just said, that level of attraction of having your own mission, your own goals, your own drive and all those things, it's the same for me. I'm not attracted to someone that just wants a credit card to go and spend and just kick back and do that kind of stuff. Like, not you, my thing. You nailed two words that I reckon are really, really important. You went, how many people say, you know, I can't do that because of, and you changed it too. This is really powerful, by the way. I don't know if you picked up on it. Despite, despite having a kid, despite not having uh, an, a business or despite um, not having date nights, despite this, I still achieve bam 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 like what guy do you want to be because of this i didn't or despite this i did i think that you, you hit the nail on the head there i mean language we know is so powerful but that that was that's bloody key mate i really like that i really like that i've played with like this whole i've been in this headspace for nine months <laughs> month, nine months now so it's been a lot like how am i going to frame this that serves me to keep pushing because there's been stacks of time, like plenty of times where I've just thought, you know what? I wonder what a nine to five would be like. Just get a salary. I don't have to post content. I don't have to. Just do my job. I go home. I get my paycheck. I don't have to grow a business. Like, that must be wonderful. Like it must be so stress free. Like there's nothing to think about. There's so much time for activities and like heaps of stuff to do. Like so many benefits to it. Like we both have that discussion as to what that must be like. But then, nah, I get bored. <laughs> I find ways to create my own chaos, or I you end up I... like find other things, other hobbies and shit to do anyway. But like it's, it is real. Like having those those things, but. It's, as you said, as I kind of said before, it's doing all those things 
despite that. And so if everything came easy, then it probably wouldn't be that exciting. We need to find ways to escalate it to make it hard, whether we'd be like, okay, cool, one mil is boring. How do we make it 10 mil, 100 mil, billion dollars? Like how do we blow it up massively? Yeah. Or if that went, we don't have that capacity, how do we tear it down so we can build it up again? Because we were good at that phase. So let's make it fucking interesting, add a bit of spice to this. And then we, we make it interesting in one way or another. So if I'm going to be challenged, if I'm going to feel anxious, if I'm going to feel unsure about all these things, I at least want to be doing something that's going to be worth it, that has that chance for that payoff, that is not me in the, the lowest vibration, living stressed out day to day, anxious and creating unnecessary problems for myself that don't have a positive payoff. I don't have a big payoff either. Yeah. Right. Nick, how have, how have you been the unit, mate? How have you created a space so Paris has also been able to be – I don't want to say – I don't ever want to use the term more than a mother because I think being a mother is absolutely an insane job in itself. But lots of women mm. do want to be more than a mother. They want to have stuff. They want to feel like there's independence. How have you kind of provided that? To be honest, it's it, it's just been it's been a thing about communication, um, and where where we were very different people a few years back. Um, she was very business driven, and she just yeah with with her own personal journey. So she she also got quite quite ill. Um, she wanted us. She needed to step away. She didn't have capacity. So it was just a thing of look. I mean, what are what are the what are the primary things that you want to be doing in your life to get the most out of your experience? Where not everyone is being affected by this to the same degree. And one of the hats that she couldn't wear anymore was working in the regular way. So the agreement was, well, look, um, I I'm a hundred percent with holding down the fort at home with, you know supporting in terms of like the parenting etc making sure we all on the same page making sure you've got cooked meals and things um and i'm here from like a, a viewpoint of like I'll, I'll look into your business but as a third person even a fourth person and like look at things and i can bounce things off because i'm not involved i can see it clearer um so i'd move more into a space of being like a confidant um or consiglia and we could sit there and have these discussions um, about like what the next steps are, um, where I'm going to be putting my resources behind, um, which will then obviously have a net effect on us. And it was just a thing of like, okay, we're going to, I don't want to say divide and conquer, but essentially that's, that's what it, what, what it is now versus what it was. And that opened up um, a lot more capacity and space for her healing. And it also gave me the opportunity to really step in um, into the space versus where I was previously, where I felt disempowered in being the sole provider for the family. And to be honest with you, maybe the money comes through my bank account, but without her and having the other things taken care of, and even just some of those crucial conversations in the back end, I wouldn't be the same person I am today. And I wouldn't be in the position that I am today. Um, without those uh, things in place. So I, I think, I, Harry, like I completely I understand that I was living in the same same space, but we, we kind of had to cut off a limb or two to survive and, and make sense of like, okay, your, you need that in your experience. You need more time for yourself. Kids are sorted. This is done. This is done. Um, yeah, I, I, that, that made sense to, sense to us. And um, it, it's worked. And I think that that's the beauty of this whole thing. You can have, you know, two, three, four, five, ten different approaches to relationship and who does what. But at the end of the day, through just looking at our experience from where we were as kids, one of the fundamental, you know, things that came up that and patterns that I refuse to repeat is being a shitty parent that's not involved. Because my kid is not going to give a single fuck 
about the business that I've built versus the fact that I was present having that conversation with him whilst he was playing with sticks. And in turn, I like we built our lives where we could facilitate more of that where I can piss off in the afternoon and go to the beach and go be dead. Because I've suffered enough. I went through enough suffering and I made enough shitty choices to notice, oh, I don't want to do that again. I want to do something else. And maybe I work late at night. Maybe there's a Saturday and a Sunday sacrifice. Like you said, it's our own business. There's more risk. But fuck, the reward is priceless. You can always make more money. Can't make more time. And presence in that time, that's a whole other conversation. So going on the form of questions to help our guys reframe, what would be a question you would have for the men who are maybe either going into parenthood or parent themselves or in a point in their relationship where it's not as good as it could be? What would be the question you'd get them to ask themselves? Why are you doing it? Why are you there? Why? Why do you want to be in that relationship? Why do you want to be a father? Well, you're a father. Well, why do you want to be a father? Maybe you don't want to be a father. That's okay. But then why did you decide to have the kids? Why did you decide to take that action? It's a very simple question. Why? It is. It's a very hard one to answer, but a very easy answer. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's, no, it's not. Why? You, you, it's, it's, it's a thing of like, why do you want to have an affair? Oh, because my partner just isn't there for me. Well, why didn't you have a conversation with her? I, why don't you bring in the same level of commitment and desire in the bedroom as you are with the person that you're busy sleeping with on the side? Why? It's, it's a very simple question, but guys don't want to ask that. It's much, it's much easier to go find someone else and go pour all of the shit that you want into that person versus the one that's there because it's convenient. They became part of the furniture. So, well, because you have to also acknowledge that 50% of that is your shit, right? <laughs> and it avoids you having to work on yourself because if you just throw that out with the trust, you're like, oh, I can just start it, start new and hope that they don't have, they can compensate for all the things that I don't want to have to work on. Exactly. Easy choice, hard life, hard choice, easy life. Hey guys, thank you so much for your time. For those guys listening, I hope you've got some value out of that. Please, if you want more of this, if you want to be around other men, we have over 20,000 guys in our group who are going through similar challenges, who are chasing after similar summits, and there are stacks of resources in there to help out. There's conversations with coaches in there. We are all in there inside the DMs. We also do free live trainings and manifestation Mondays as well with Nick. So I'll put the link somewhere around so you can come and join us there. Look forward to seeing you around. Hope you enjoyed it.